Yeah, so so the key result, I guess, from from the the 1.5 uh, special report was that there is like a substantial difference between 1.5 degrees and two degrees on the okay. one hand uh, for impacts, that it really makes a lot of sense to pursue 1.5 degrees because there are really substantial impacts in terms of human suffering and uh, ecological damage uh, f in between those those uh, two um, keystones basically. Um, and at the same time, it said like, yeah, every ton of carbon matters, every uh, every action matters. So we can still like, in theory, limit uh, warming to, to 1.5 degrees if we act now, if we halve emissions by 2030 um, and go to net zero around uh, mid-century. I think that's a absolutely crucial point because um, yeah, there has been like a strong development in the modeling to include more and more negative emissions, for instance, because the declines in carbon emissions became subsequently much more ambitious with uh, carbon emissions rising. Um, so it was initially it was thought of as a backstop technology, which can like in an emergency, like if everything <laughs> fails, you know, you can have a bit of that. Yeah. Um, but then it became like a cornerstone of, of modeling more and more. And the result was basically that the degrowth scenarios, which partly show like the strong uh, negative GDP uh, development in the short term, they perform better in terms of those technological indicators. They have less, they're closer to the historical, uh, historical development and uh, hence we argue there's less risk and less uncertainty associated. Uh, with them, you still need like energy efficiency improvements, and you still need uh, renewable energy transition, and you also need some degree of negative emissions. But it's a lot less than in the established scenarios. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Circular Metabolism Podcast, the bi-weekly meeting where we have in-depth discussions with researchers, policymakers, and practitioners to better understand the metabolism of our cities, or in other words, their resource use and pollution emissions, and how to reduce them in a systemic, socially just, and context-specific way. I'm your host, Aristide, from Metabolism of Cities, and on today's episode, we'll spend some more time on examining IPCC scenarios and why they might have a blind spot. In fact, the IPCC spe special report on 1.5 degrees assumes in most, if not all, of their scenarios that there is going to be a continued uh, growth in GDP, and the latter is necessary to support so societal well-being, uh, and therefore, to achieve this societal well-being and the increase of, of GDP, we would need, at the same time, controversial amounts of carbon dioxide removal and technological change. What if we flipped this question and instead of only focusing on efficiency, we also explored sufficiency? So by exploring post-growth and degrowth scenarios, what would that look like? Can we drastically reduce and converge the energy use between the global north and the global south? And can we reduce the risk of getting to 1.5 degrees by using these type of scenarios? To discuss all of that, I have Lawrence Kaiser, which is a researcher here at the Université de Lausanne. And uh, Lawrence has been exploring post-growth and degrowth policies uh, for mitigated, mitigating greenhouse gas emissions, which at the moment, as I mentioned, are overlooked. As you will discover, Lawrence walks the talk as well, as, and he's involved in a number of uh, associations and has a quite unique story to, to share. I think it will surprise some of you. Um, just before kicking the episode, I'd like to encourage you to continue this discussion by telling what you have learned, what you have also was surprising to you, and also continue the discussion with your colleagues and friends after this episode. With all that being said, Lawrence, welcome to the episode. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Arsti, for having me. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. <laughs> uh, thanks for the invitation. Yeah, it, it was, of course, very. I was very happy to, to read that uh, you're now based in Lausanne, so it, it made this very easy. Um, I want to start perhaps with a bit of your backstory, meaning how did you get interested in this uh, post-growth, degrowth, ecological economy, uh, how, economics? Where do you position yourself and how did you arrive to this? Um, okay, so um, I it all, I guess, started in my uh, youth. Uh, when I was around 16 years old, I uh, got 
very interested in environmental questions mm -hmm. via a friend of mine who was a vegetarian at the moment and he provoked me a bit that I was still eating eating meat and then I thought about it and uh, thought okay he has a point so I also uh, became vegetarian and that brought me into like um, yeah some more activist groups uh, uh, w which are re relatively liberal groups like uh, Greenpeace Youth or something and then I studied environmental uh, science because of that um, and um, during these studies I, I got in touch with lots of um, students, co-students co of mine, colleagues uh, which were interested in a variety of topics and I think that was sort of the first avenue through through my colleagues that I got in touch with with growth critical ideas or post growth ideas we also had a lecture um, in our um, bachelor's which was about ecological economics and and uh, post growth ideas um, which was where sorry uh, at ETH uh, mm -hmm. uh, from from professor Amy Seidel, uh, um a lecture on this so so this was I think the first um, real real contact with post growth degrowth ideas um, but the, I would say the the, the coin really <laughs> dropped uh, when I did an exchange semester in, in Leeds uh, at the University of Leeds and uh, visited a lecture of Professor Julia Steinberger and uh, um, read an actual book on degrowth, uh, the um, degrowth vocabulary for a new uh -huh. era. Uh -huh. um, by Der Lisa and et al. So so that was really where I I I thought okay that concept really has some some um, something to it and has potential and describes something um, which is missing from um, mainstream uh, environmental protection debates mm. so I think that was sort of a key turning point where I um, really read up on those ideas and and got very um, passionate about about them and I mean before we focus on uh, some of your findings um, I would like to, to help everyone to, to get on at the same page, at the same level. Uh, I said in the introduction that we're going to talk perhaps of uh, IPCC, IPCC scenarios, the special report, um, some of the assumptions that they are doing. So perhaps can you provide us with a very brief overview of, you know, what are some of the uh, models used or scenarios built and how does that work? and and what were the results of the uh, special report, perhaps. Mm -hmm. I think that will help everyone to, before we get into the results and your research, yeah. to, to have a, sem a common ground. Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, the, the, the key starting point of much of my work was uh, that w was actually the, the, the IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees. Um, and uh, it... it uh, yeah, they they review the existing literature on on a lot of topics for for climate uh, mitigation and adaptation and etc. So um, a key role in in these reports are taken up by integrated assessment models, uh, which are very complicated uh, <laughs> models, um, which uh, I'm also like um, no real expert of. Like I've never really worked with one of those complicated uh, IMs because it takes um, years mm. to to really uh, uh, work yourself into them um, so uh, yeah but but these are models which basically combine um, many aspects of the human um, climate human environment interaction uh, including like an economy mo module a energy module um, land use change uh, module, climate module, and how those interact. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, for instance, the economy module then calculates the the prices and GDP resulting from the energy trajectory and and, and these kind of things f feeding back into it again. Um, so so these interactions make these models so so complicated because there are uh, tons of aspects which which need to be considered and uh, uh, taken care of. <clears throat> and these interactions are based on literature and stuff like that, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And uh, estimates for um, impacts of, for instance, uh, behavioral change on, on certain levers, which then reduce energy use and then carbon emissions and etc. Mm -hmm. Feeding back into a climate module, um, which gives out then numbers on, on warming, um, etc. <clears throat> so, um, 
Yeah, the, the IPCC reviews these these modules, uh, which come from uh, many teams around the world, uh, which which have built those module models, and there are like a few which are very prominent. Mm -hmm. um, I would say so. They were also used to um, establish a framework with to you to work with those models. Uh, th th these are called the shared socioeconomic pathways, and um, they basically. Um, cast some some uh, storylines uh, for the future which uh, which um, are then translated into the module uh, into the model with uh, nu numeric uh, assumptions and basically each of those uh, pathways uh, is then sort of linked to one baseline model um, so there are about five of those um, really prominent models but there are much many more models of course <clears throat> So these scenarios from those integrated assessment modeling teams are then submitted to the IPCC, mm -hmm. uh, uh, who reviews them. Um, yeah. So so the key result, I guess, from from the the 1.5 uh, special report was that there is like a substantial difference between 1.5 degrees and two degrees on the okay. one hand uh, for impacts, that it really makes a lot of sense to pursue 1.5 degrees because. There are really substantial impacts in terms of human suffering and uh, ecological damage uh, f in between those those uh, two um, keystones, basically. Um, and at the same time, it said like, yeah, every ton of carbon matters, every uh, every action matters. So we can still like, in theory, limit uh, warming to to 1.5 degrees if we act now, if we halve emissions by 2030. Um, and go to net zero around uh, mid-century. Um, so there is like possibility to act and it makes sense to act and we mm. can act. Mm. Um, so these were like, I, I think the, the key uh, results from, from the report. Um, and and yeah. these models, so sorry. So these within these models, you had, I guess, numerical values of the temperature mm -hmm. and then also of the components, this is how the economy would look like by the end of the century. This is what the energy would look like, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yeah. So, so these sh these shared socioeconomic pathways they come along with like assumptions on how population develops, uh, or how GDP develops, um, the also how like global coordination, um, uh, cooperation. Uh, develops like more optimistic, more pessimistic mm -hmm. uh, uh, scenarios. Whether there is like social conflict and and uh, uh, which makes then mitigation harder. So they are oriented around like challenges to mitigation and adaptation. So some scenarios pose less challenges, um, which are like uh, the SSP one, for instance, which is more like a green growth uh, <laughs> storyline actually, because it combines like quite strong economic growth with like sustainable transformation, high cooperation, uh, these kind of assumptions. And it's sort of the, uh, in, in these scenarios, the easiest pathway to 1.5 degrees. It poses the least challenges mm. uh, to mitigation. And yeah, uh, exactly. So the the models then use those those uh, shared um, uh, socioeconomic pathways to combine them um, with with assumptions on um, how climate policy develops, and um, like for instance through a carbon price, higher lower carbon price, and uh, then they arrive at um, um, greenhouse gas emission uh, trajectories and carbon uh, concentrations in the atmosphere, and then this leads to to the warming um, so yeah that's that's sort of to give the integrated assessment modeling uh, community more of a framework and to to make also the the comparisons and stuff m more easy and to to coordinate uh, these kind of things yeah, and, yeah. So, and so that gives like a vast trumpet of different scenarios different pathways yeah with more or less warming yeah yeah exactly and yeah some of these have been strongly criticized like uh, the SSP5 with like a return to coal which now seems rather unrealistic maybe uh, um, so so there are also like scenarios which have super high con concentrations of uh, carbon emissions which um, yeah uh, are, have been criticized as, as unrealistic if, uh, from a purely energy system uh, standpoint. Mm. Um, but of course also other kinds of criticism as like the post-growth, degrowth literature would say that uh, yeah, they are all, all growth scenarios. <laughs> uh, and, and the scenarios which have also less growth 
um, they're often also accompanied, accompanied by social conflicts and mm. uh, more challenges to mitigation. Mm. Um, so um, they are not uh, able to, to meet, for instance, the 1.5 degree target SSP3, uh, which is like the, the scenario of like a conflictual unequal development. Yeah. So. It was quite interesting indeed, because when I read uh, some of the papers, it mentioned that, uh, well, you and your co-authors mentioned that there might be some <laughs> fundamental flaws in them because of their risky assumptions, meaning that all of them, of the 222 IPCC scenarios, were, uh, well, have, well, had growth embedded in them or something mm -hmm. like that. Is, is that the case, or, or how does that really en entangle mm -hmm. together? Yeah, so so I have to say that uh, in the in the 1.5 degree uh, special report, uh, th there were around 222 uh, scenarios, but now with the AR6, uh, there are many more uh, uh, scenarios, um, and it's also important to to emphasize that uh, the IPCC doesn't create those scenarios; mm. it's, it just reviews the ex existing li literature, and um, it's more like. A, that the, the integrated assessment community hasn't yeah. explored mm -hmm. uh, those post-growth and degrowth pathways. Mm -hmm. And in, indeed, like on a global level, they, they all show growth in, uh, until 2100, uh, all the 1.5 uh, degree scenarios, um, but also in, in rich countries like uh, the EU or the US, the OECD, they, they all grow, nev although they are already quite rich. So, so that's like also a point we 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 mention, mm -hmm. um, because their growth might not be as necessary as uh, somewhere else. Um, so yeah, but th all of them show growth, and 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 the countries which have uh, or the scenarios which have declining growth, there are there are also some um, scenarios where some countries in the global north, for instance, they have declining growth um, because of less productivity improvements and declining population, uh, for instance. But these are then, um, yeah, not sort of uh, cast as uh, as maybe a chance or uh, connected to um, some maybe positive developments, but it's rather seen as a problem. It's and more a recession rather than yeah, something. Yeah, exactly. Like it's it's a it's a it's it's a problem and uh, something undesirable. Um, and yeah, as I said, look, th these scenarios they are then also not able to to meet the one point five degree target. Um, yeah, so it's basically it's basically a trade-off. If you have uh, yeah, less growth, you have higher challenges to mitigation. Um, but if you have more growth, like in SSP1, uh, you can have uh, lower challenges to mitigation, mm -hmm. although SSP5 also has strong growth, but uh, high challenges uh, to mitigation. So it's, yeah, it's a bit uh, complicated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, for I think for the mere uh, human or mortal, it's... It's hard to see clear and hard to understand all of that, but I understand that at least all of them, um, all of the the models and the scenarios reviewed, had a component of growth inside, mm. and and somehow so you and your colleagues say okay so what if <laughs> what if instead we because well perhaps we should remind that um, by saying that there is more growth then you also need to assume that there's going to be a lot of technological change and a lot of you know carbon dioxide sequestration or capture because one should lead to to the other yeah and that's more or less betting on something right yeah uh, absolutely i think that's a absolutely crucial point because um yeah there has been like a strong development in the modeling to include more and more negative emissions for instance because the declines in carbon emissions became subsequently much more ambitious with uh, carbon emissions rising. Um, so it was initially it was thought of as a backstop technology, which can like in an emergency, like if everything <laughs> fails, you know, you can have a bit of that. Yeah. Um, but then it became like a cornerstone of, of modeling more and more. Um, and this is one aspect of, of the m more speculative or, or risky assumptions in, in the modeling, because uh, many models also assume that Although you have the high GDP growth, uh, you also have a partly extremely steep decline in, mm -hmm. in energy consumption, mm -hmm. for instance, uh, which then results in, I mean, coupled results in a very high energy efficiency increase. 
which other studies have then cast doubt on that this is un completely unprecedented um, in terms of yeah what we have seen since the last uh, 40 over 40 years yeah. um, and uh, yeah so there are a lot of problems with with for instance assuming this strong decoupling between energy consumption and, and GDP also because many mechanisms which lead to rebound effects for instance mm -hmm. which then reduce the energy savings uh, are, are not included in the in the model um, so there's a risk of overestimating the the gains there um, and yeah additionally there of course this the next level lever is the the renewable energy transformation um, which is which is of course important um, and there's a bit of a debate going on whether like integrated assessment models under or overestimate uh, those those changes and there I think there are also good arguments for for, for like the the underestimation of, of renewable energy speed um, but nevertheless uh, those speeds in the 1.5 degree scenarios they are um, much faster than the maximum speeds which we have mm -hmm. observed even in like uh, uh, yeah um, rich countries which which have pushed um, quite a bit in, in this direction um, so yeah this is also in in this sense uh, many cases unprecedented so um, yeah and also has other impacts in terms of social and ecological aspects for instance the mining uh, aspect is a crucial one so yeah that's basically what what we highlight that all those levers they 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 can be questioned and there are risks associated with them um, so yeah, why why don't we explore potential alternatives which uh, could reduce mm. those risks? And um, yeah, that's what we highlight. Uh, we should be doing, yeah. basically. Yeah, and uh, well, the the episode should come soon. But uh, I had also um, an episode with uh, Dominic Wiedenhofer that did the um, the decoupling or the systematic review that there is no decoupling or. There is a decoupling for just some flows and some specific cases. So just as a reminder, there is no absolute decoupling observed or there is for for three or four countries, but it's not at the at the pace that we need and for all of the materials or for all of the flows, something like that, right? Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. The study was tremendous. Uh, <laughs> Everybody uh, cites that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's crazy. But um, no, it yeah, abso absolutely. Like for, for material use, there's no decoupling uh, uh, especially. But for carbon emissions, there's some decoupling for some countries, uh, especially rich countries. Um, in, the, in the European Union, for instance, even if you include the imports, the, car the consumption-based uh, accounting, um, which is then often or very often shown as a proof that green yeah. growth is, yeah. is here and 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 working, uh, which is way too too fast uh, in in my view because, um, as you said, like the rates are way too small um, and they were also associated many times with uh, with the last financial crisis in two thousand eight two thousand nine, mm. which was followed by uh, quite low GDP growth rates. Um, that was also highlighted in some papers on it that if you would have had normal growth um, yeah. as before, then you probably wouldn't have seen this decoupling, um, this absolute decoupling. Yeah. So yeah, there's a lot of uh, uh, nuance, nuance, I think, yeah. to, to these numbers. Yeah. Okay, so now ideally we should go to the... Um, okay, before we present the scenarios, let's perhaps make sure that we are on the same footing as well with the definition of post-growth, degrowth and all that. You, there's many, many different definitions, a bit like a circular economy. There's a, a myriad of definitions. How could you very simply provide a, a definition of, uh, of a post-growth or degrowth uh, policy society or something like that? Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, yeah, that's a that's a crucial point, uh, I think, because yeah, there's a lot. I mean, uh, some of those words they they are also often misunderstood. So I think that's that's important. Um, yeah, so so degrowth. Um, I, I would define degrowth uh, as a start as a like a social um, social transformation, which um, sort of is aimed at um, yeah providing a good life for for everyone. Um, via like um, increased democracy, increased uh, equity, and uh, uh, participation, and um, and this social transformation then results in a in a decline in in um, carbon emissions, material use, energy use, um, and in turn 
also most likely results in a decline in, in GDP because many of those measures um, have have this effect on on, on GDP. Um, for instance, working less and, and these kind of things. Um, so it's it's yeah it's it's these three steps basically like a um, a, a social transformation which then um, leads to uh, less environmental impact and uh, also likely less GDP growth. Mm. Um, and it's also I would say especially if we look at the international debate, it's more advanced in terms of um, being more explicit about what this transformation entails uh, in terms of. Um, moving beyond the growth drivers and growth imperatives in the system, which are often associated with capitalism. So degrowth is um, more openly anti-capitalist mm -hmm. um, in, in tendency uh, than, for instance, post-growth, which, which has similar goals, like making the economy independent, uh, the well-being uh, of the people independent from, from uh, economic growth and pursuing the sustainability transition. Um, but it um, includes many more strands, I would say, many more uh, camps, which, for instance, are not so openly anti-capitalist or mm -hmm. which, um, yeah, which which are agnostic about this or, and yeah, yeah. So so there are a lot of different different camps which are not in some aspects not so explicit or less or more explicit in other aspects, um, but um, yeah. One could describe them as more re reformist, for instance, like to pursue more uh, reforms within the system, mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, or cultural changes uh, with a stronger focus on cultural changes and less on economic structures and these kind of things. So, um, yeah, there are a lot of lot of different strands, and it's very heterogeneous <laughs> internally. So, so that's an important point to keep in mind. There's, there's not, I would say, there's not the degrowth, uh, um, yeah. Um, storyline so, or yeah. or yeah um, program let's mm. say um, there are overlaps and uh, some important um, commonalities um, but beyond the point it gets uh, uh, also um, controversial I would say like internally mm. and uh, and there you are you're set to develop your scenarios I don't know if that coincided with the moment where you did your research day in uh, in Australia um, but let's make a, a small interlude. That's where you, you have your, your crazy story. Um, so for those who don't know, um, the University of Sydney has some of the, the best input-output modelers in the world, Manfred Lenzen, um, Tommy Witt, uh, uh, Wittmann, and all of this team, which is fantastic. And somehow you wanted to connect with them, and you said, okay, I'm going to go there, but you choose a rather peculiar <laughs> way to go there, or let's say the more in line with your values way way to go there so can you just share this uh, this story I, I, it's funny when i meant when i had the discussion with uh, with julia she mentioned she mentioned your name and then uh i didn't make the link between your name in the papers and your name doing the the actual thing but uh, can you perhaps share the story uh yeah that's a, that's a bit of a longer one but um yeah. Um, so my 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 partner at the time, uh, Julia, uh, she had a friend um, from Australia, her best friend uh, Rosa, and um, she m married in in Australia and she moved back to to Australia. Uh, the, the the best friend, um, and um, uh, Julia was about was then supposed to become the maiden of honor for for this wedding, um, but we decided both to not fly anymore so it was like yeah we we can't participate no like it's it's uh, it's impossible and somehow during uh, like a tea or coffee i don't quite remember in the <laughs> living room we we were um discuss discussing somehow this idea dropped yeah maybe we could go there without flying and um we were discussing this over months many months and then this plan developed of going there without flying. And uh, after many months of planning, we we uh, took the Trans-Siberian Railway uh, through Russia, Mongolia and China and uh, jumped on a cargo ship in China and <laughs> went there for, for two weeks over the over the sea and stayed in Australia for one year. Uh, so it was actually worth it, <laughs> the yeah. whole uh, journey. Um, and then went back the the same way, basically. 
Um, but yeah, this was, it, and you're right, this was coinciding with uh, with my encounter in, in, in Sydney and the work there, um, which was what I was doing during, during the time in, in Sydney. Um, but yeah, all in all, it was an incredible effort <laughs> to, to do this journey. Um, and uh, it wasn't it was not easy for for both of us to to do it um and we also had a lot of uh, b barriers to overcome like we yeah. and we were very privileged already with the right passports and stuff so um yeah you yeah, have to have how do you book yourself within a cargo ship you know what i mean that's uh, a it's actually quite easy oh uh, yeah 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 there i mean it's it's very expensive uh, oh, okay. um, but oh. there are like agencies travel agencies which have the contacts of all those um uh, shipping companies and they uh, offer usually like one free cabin uh, okay. on the ships. Some routes it's more uh, um, already, um, but yeah, then you can just ask the agency and they, they can sort of um, get you um, a cabin. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very expensive, unfortunately. You um, would have thought, I mean, you, you don't weigh that much, so <laughs> I could imagine that uh, that's not the most... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, it's sort of. Uh, it's a basic. You have a hotel room and mm -hmm. you get three mm -hmm. meals a day, um, and ah, yeah, it's yeah, it's yeah. a lot of uh, th things included, um, and yeah. So so yeah, but um, that was it. Was an um, incredible experience for sure. Um, yeah, but of course, I I always try to to sort of uh, put this into perspective because uh -huh. uh, it also sort of uh, gives the the impression that sort of um, individual solutions to, yeah, to yeah, the, yeah. yeah these kind of uh, things so and that's also very problematic discourse and very dominant discourse um, so uh, it's also important to push back against that that the system needs to change and we need like uh, uh, collective political solutions to these problems and it's not I think with with this journey we we on the one hand wanted to show that it's kind of possible mm -hmm. to to do um but also um yeah to 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 try it ourselves whether whether it's possible and see whether whether we could do it and i guess it was also driven by our conscious conscious that we couldn't yeah we couldn't just go into the plane uh, yeah but yeah so how long was it uh, one and a half months each way um, Each way, one and a half months. One and a half yeah. months, and, okay. and we were already quite quick, I would say. Hmm. Like we made some stops in between, of course, but not super long, like four to five days, um, this kind of thing. So yeah, and then like one year staying. I'm yeah. taking notes. I'm taking notes. Uh, <laughs> I did back in the day uh, my research day or half of my PhD in Australia as well, but I wasn't that uh, quick to to think about this. Um, yeah. So you arrive now in Australia, you're part uh, of the University of Sydney group, and you start saying, okay, let's start um, doing this, uh, this new, is it a new model or is it just the scenarios? How, how does it work mm -hmm. by proposing these uh, post-growth uh, and degrowth scenario? Mm -hmm. how, how did you go about, okay, we have what exists already, the integrated assessment models, and what did you do and what did they give you? Okay, so um, yeah, I, I have to say I, I wrote my bachelor thesis in mm -hmm. uh, in Sydney as well, and there I was looking at integrated assessment uh, data output in terms of uh, land use change, um, and uh, during this engagement with with integrated assessment models, I was reading some critiques of of them as well, uh, especially the one from from Kai Kuhnhan uh, from Germany, with, who wrote about that there's um, like a blind spot in terms of uh, uh, no um, degrowth, post-growth scenarios being developed. Um, so I actually thought, okay, I write my master thesis about this. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I was writing like a sort of pre-proposal for, for this uh, at the time. And um, after my bachelor's thesis, I thought, okay, now I have half a year time, and I had the privilege to, to not, um, <laughs> not, to not having to find a paid job, because my parents still supported me. So I thought, okay, I can do uh, what I like to do. Um, so I. And that was, I am Sandy. <laughs> and that was I am Sandy Grove. Uh, so I, I could. Um, I I, th I just th searched. Okay, who are the people in Sydney who have to do with with uh, degrowth and and these kind of issues? And there I came across 
uh, uh, among others, Professor Manfred Lenson and mm. Arunima Malik. Mm. And I just wrote them e an email. Hey, um, yeah, can I can I do an internship at, at your place? And uh, yeah, they were very open to this, um, and we had a chat. Um, I was initially very overwhelmed <laughs> with <laughs> with all the information and 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 the the, the conversations. They were very in depth, very mathematical. Mm. Um, yeah, coming from an input output analysis yeah. uh, view, uh, no surprise. But um, yeah, I was I was still <laughs> overwhelmed. Um, and then I basically um, discussed this pre-proposal uh, uh, with Professor Manfred Lenson. And um, yeah, he said, um, uh, we, had a, we had a long back and forth about, about degrowth uh, by emails. And uh, one day well, he... What was his uh, point of view about, about degrowth? Because I, I know how he speaks on it a bit... Uh like on the side, but was he interested in it or did he also think it was a blind spot between his research and the rest or? Uh, um, yeah. I, th I think it was primarily, he he, he asked a lot of questions mm. uh, about it and I tried to answer to the best <laughs> of my ability uh, uh, with yeah, trying to point to important literature bits. Um, and um, I, I guess it was, there, was, there was an interest there uh, to 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 um, get to know more of it, um, and in this process of of these conversations, um, yeah, I think I think it um, uh, he he saw some potential in in it, and uh, developed and as a next step like a very simple model. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's maybe the the next step, mm -hmm. um, the a very simple model in Excel of the of the energy um, sector global top down. Model of the of the energy sector. Very easy. Um, very <laughs> yeah, uh, he, I think he did this in two days or something, yeah. and uh, I was yeah uh, uh, impressed. But uh, and he he, uh, he showed me this model and mm. asked me, yeah, can you do something with this? Um, and then I I thought about it. I looked at it and um, played around a bit and uh, said yes, I think we can do something with this. Um, and uh, this was how the, the idea of the 1.5 degree degrowth scenario paper was born. <coughs> so um, yeah, and then we started with to to develop this model. Like we noticed, okay, it um, it lacks maybe carbon capture and storage and mm. uh, negative emissions. So, so um, yeah, we tried to build this in in, in collaboration and uh, adapted it in terms of, we've, at first we only had primary energy use and then we uh, incorporated final energy use as well. Um, and um, um, yeah, then also GDP because we 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 hadn't we haven't had it in the in the beginning. Mm. So we basically we tried to uh, include all those major levels which which are in the literature and where which also other papers have said sort of if you if you evaluate the feasibility of scenarios you can look at those um, 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 indicators uh, like uh, negative emissions, energy efficiency, renewable energy increase, etc. And yeah, this was in 2019, and uh, the paper got published 2021. So over two years, uh, we developed this model, basically, which was always thought not as a replacement of IAMs or something, mm -hmm. because it's way too simple uh, to to cover those aspects, but as a supplement, basically, to it. Um, like and an exploratory toy model, something like basically, that. Basically, yeah. 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 Um, and uh, yeah, we, we changed a lot through the time. Um, and um, yeah, then included basically uh, representations of the mainstream model. We approximated those with with our model, mm. um, so to represent sort of the biggest trends in the IPCC report, um, and um, went beyond it in terms of also including um, some more extreme cases, like <laughs> if you if you uh, use much more renewable energy much quicker. Uh, for instance, and um, then uh, also degrowth scenarios, of, of course, um, which we basically implemented via um, yeah, reducing final energy use and then coupling uh, GDP on it with a sort of historically average um, uh, energy efficiency improvement. Mm -hmm. um, so th this was the, the interacting link between final energy use and GDP. And this it was... was a energy descent somehow... 
this then yielded, uh, yeah, the, the assumption was sort of the energy descent, which you can also find in the literature through the low energy demand uh, mm -hmm. scenario, for instance, um, which has very strongly decreasing energy use, but they have um, strongly increasing GDP uh, as well um, because they don't explicitly look at this interaction. Um, so that was basically we, we fixed this interaction to mm -hmm. the historical um, level of energy efficiency improvement and this then yielded like the decline also in GDP um, in, in the short term. So it, it wasn't yourself that forced the model to decrease the GDP. It was by doing the energy model saying we're going to have a descent and these are the rates of uh, gains or of efficiency and stuff like that. Yeah. That that resulted to a re uh, reduction of GDP. Yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, then then after like um, I think uh, how was it after the the energy transition is completed, we basically kept energy use um, constant and uh, also GDP constant. Um, so so this was basically the the logic behind it and uh, the goal was really to compare those mainstream scenarios mm -hmm. in the IPCC uh, with these degrowth archetypes so we had different scenarios of degrowth with more or less negative emissions with a higher or lower renewable energy transformation um, but also like in I would say maybe more extreme case like the 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 decent living energy scenario uh, uh, from from uh, Joel Milward Hopkins et al., which really tries to research what would be needed to um, have decent living standards at the minimum for 10 billion people in 20, mm -hmm. 2050, um, sort of as the lower bound. Um, so we also included that that scenario, um, and yeah. Y it was crazy how 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 well this performed like you you, you only need very little uh, renewable energy increase with with such a very low energy consumption uh -huh, uh -huh. so so yeah we basically plotted this on on a big plot uh, to compare it with historical data on on those uh, indicators like energy efficiency negative emissions and uh, renewable energy increase and the result was basically that the degrowth scenarios which partly show like the strong uh, negative GDP uh, development in the short term, they perform better in terms of those technological indicators. They have less, they're closer to the historical uh, historical development and uh, hence we argue there's less risk and less uncertainty associated mm -hmm. uh, with them. You still need like energy efficiency improvements and you still need uh, renewable energy transition and you also need some degree of negative emissions but it's a lot less than in the established scenarios yeah. um, I, I think this is quite important to to underline i mean we also frequently make the the dichotomy degrowth equals no technology or degrowth equals no renewable energy i think it's also very i mean quite nuanced to to add them up that you know that this facilitates the solution so much so that the rest the technology renewable energies and all of that are just a small complement. Yeah, ab absolutely. Like it's it's very important to stress that uh, also a degrowth scenario includes uh, strong renewable energy expansion and energy efficiency improvements, etc. But additionally to that, you have the sufficiency aspect, mm. uh, which scales down socially less necessary forms of production and consumption, um, and hence makes the transition easier in these in these terms. So what we basically did is put a few numbers on those already known uh, um, 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 yeah, statements, basically, mm. and, and try to show how much better uh, it would be with this very simple model, of course, to motivate like further research uh, in this areas or to explore whether this would make sense, uh, the research. Um, so yeah, the result was in these terms of technical, technological indicators, it makes totally sense, and it's very, it's actually, um, if you if you see the graph, it's a bit like it's just too easy. Yeah, it, it's a bit like okay, th th they are so close, and we don't research this. Like, mm. how how can this be? Like, yeah, why do we go so far away from from all uh, the the historical uh, trends? Um, but of course, we also say. Uh, they also like uh, the trade-off is that uh, a degrowth scenario would um, imply a lot of 
social and political changes, uh, which also, uh, yeah, are connected to social conflicts with current power structures and, and these kind of topics. Um, so there w would be more challenge there in terms of uh, uh, transformation than um, with, say, a green growth scenario, which leaves everything more or less as it is, but just change it, changes the technology. Um, but um, yeah, then we argue, okay, um, um, you you on the one hand it's very hard to say how what is politically feasible yeah, this can change uh, uh, very quickly uh, with as we have seen I think uh, uh, with things like COVID or so uh, Ukraine uh, crisis um, so it's not a reason not to not mm -hmm. to explore this. Yeah. So, if we have to compare your results with the IPCC report or you know. Do we stay under the 1.5 degrees with the degrowth scenarios? How well do we fit in all of that? C can you uh, provide a bit with some um, examples or some comparison between the two and how drastically they differ or do they still converge in some elements and not in others? Um, so, yeah, I think if, if, if we compare it from our paper, we, we can say that um, the degrowth scenarios could meet uh, 1.5 degrees uh, with this like strong socio-political transformation, which is not covered in the mainstream scenarios, um, but with a lot less uh, energy efficiency increase, uh, negative emissions and renewable energy increase, and, and partly drastically, like the, the low energy demand scenario, which was a keystone scenario in the 1.5 degrees report, um, they have up to uh, three to four times higher uh, energy efficiency increase than, than uh, the degrowth scenarios, which is completely unprecedented. Um, um, even for single year changes, like if you have the, the, some outliers which are very, very strong in energy efficiency, like this is still par far beyond uh, what has been achieved. Um, so, yeah, one, one can really argue, okay, this, this is um, yeah, completely beyond uh, the, the, the trends and, and frankly a bit unrealistic if you also not include rebound effects and, and these kind of things. Uh, so, so these are these are big problems which the degrowth scenarios would would solve or not solve but drastically reduce, uh, at least. And also in terms of negative emissions, which I think is a, another crucial point, uh, there's a huge potential there to to reduce um, the the carbon emissions. But this is a bit of a trade-off with renewable energy. So if you, in our scenarios, if you uh, want to have basically no um, ne negative emissions. Uh, then the renewable energy transition would also need to be far quicker than than what we have seen, um, and so um, you, it seems likely that you need some amount um, still for 1.5 degrees, mm. but it opens up also the possibility to refrain from more risky technologies uh, such as bioenergy to carbon capture and storage and keep it rather with relatively well known technologies such as afforestation, reforestation and soil carbon sequestration, these kind of things. Um, so so this is a big potential there in comparison to, to the IPCC reports. Um, yeah, so yeah, but you still have this trade off, I guess, a bit with the political uh, conflicts, uh, mm. really. Um, yeah, I, I hope this answers your, your question yeah, yeah, yeah. a bit. I mean, uh, I think more, more explicitly to make it easily understandable mm -hmm. to everyone, when we talk about degrowth scenario, do we talk about decreasing by 50% on X amount of years to the amount of energy? Okay. Uh, how do we make it a bit more tangible before mm -hmm. before we also propose some policies mm -hmm. to actually get there, right? Mm. Yeah, so in terms of finer energy use, um, if I have it right in my head, it's approximately to halve it mm -hmm. um, by, by 2050, or I, I think even earlier, 2040. Um, <clears throat> which is also what the the low energy demand scenario assumes. Um, um, and in terms of decent living energy, uh, you could even still use even less, like a, a quarter, I think, yeah. uh, to to um, reach like really good living standards for, for everyone. Uh, but what I have to say is in terms of per capita uh, uh -huh. decline, uh -huh. Uh, this would be massive for the global south, uh, for the global north. Um, we we actually um, tried to put some numbers on this, 
Um, and in our degrowth scenario, I think for the global north, it would be a decline to 25% of, on average, the current um, energy consumption. And this doesn't include like imports already, so so it's even bigger if you include uh, the imports. Um, and of course, there's a huge uh, inequality also in the global north uh, with with some uh, individuals uh, um, using much more energy. So this would probably be, for, us, for some of the richest individuals, this would be a decline over 90%, yeah. probably like really, really big. Yeah. Um, for the global south, uh, this would, I think, in our degrowth scenario, on average, um, uh, remain as it is. Uh, of course, this is... Uh, too reductive because it uh, includes an internal redistribution and uh, technological transformation. Um, uh, so it would, in w with the numbers of the decent living energy scenario, it would be possible to eliminate poverty uh, in, in such a scenario if you only use the energy metrics. Um, yeah, but I also have to say that even in an aggregate growth scenario of us, which comes close to the mainstream uh, uh, IPCC scenarios, if you include a convergence of global south and global north, which you mentioned in the beginning, uh, which is an absolutely crucial point, then also the global north would need to halve uh, mm -hmm. their energy mm -hmm. use um, under, like, as assuming 10 billion people by by 2050. Um, so, yeah, and and this points to the to the fact that mainstream scenarios they come predominantly from the global north, mm -hmm. and they also cement the the inequalities in energy use. They project them in the future and don't don't have this convergence, yeah. which is a crucial neglect, I think. Um, so yeah, and in terms of GDP, which is another important uh, point, maybe uh, the the degrowth scenario, on average, I think they have a decline. Um, um, how much was it? Um, I think from from eighty, from I think in twenty 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 we start we had like eighty four trillion trillion uh, dollars, and it declines to I think seventy seventy eight or something. By 2050. Um, by 2040. I mean, it's, um, it's 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 not, an, it's not it's a not strong enormous, it's not yeah, a yeah. strong uh, yeah, yeah. decline, although again, like if you look at it on a per capita basis, uh, this yeah, would yeah. be massive for the global north. Um, yeah, and if you look at the decent living energy scenario, this also has a very strong decline in GDP because mm -hmm. I think um, the energy trajectory is just so so steep. But I mean, um, also what's interesting, we talked about convergence, which is already like leaps and bounds ahead of what we're doing right now. Ideally, it shouldn't even be a convergence. I mean, Global South needs to build the necessary infrastructure to provide services, which might need like more than the Global North for a certain period of time before they even converge or not in the distant future, right? I mm -hmm. mean, all the accumulated energy that we have within our stocks and all of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess if this is a more theoretical discussion, mm -hmm. but... Uh, I don't know if convergence is even equitable or not uh, mm -hmm. in the long run. Yeah, that's an that's an interesting point. I I, I don't have like global numbers for this. I only know like uh, um, uh, Narashima Rao has done uh, some research on this uh, for um, uh, three specific countries. Uh, I think I, I I forgot which which specific ones they were, um, but uh, there the result was that sort of the the build up of of the stocks mm -hmm. um, in order to to have this decent living energy standards, um, this build up is not too much okay. uh, energy. So it it seems uh, uh, f fairly small if I remember correctly, and uh, compared to what is then needed to maintain the it. operation. Um, yeah, for for the operation. Um, so. Uh, I, I I would expect in energy terms that maybe it's not too too much of a of a of an overcompensation basically yeah. that would be necessary, but I mean it's clear that from the global north this would mean very strong reparations for for the global south in order to to conduct such a transformation, um, which yeah, is another big political challenge <laughs> and also like debt debt forgiveness and, and yeah. these kind of things uh, very very important. Um. I, you wanted to conclude on that? Yeah. Um, I think perhaps an, another point which might help us to make it a bit more practical would be, okay, how do we take these big scenarios? What would be an intermediary step 
in order to get there? Meaning, for instance, what are some policies that could help us today um, post-growth or degrowth policies that might be the the you know the next step in order to, to achieve these scenarios, right? Mm-hmm. Do you have any examples? Well, the, you have mentioned a number of them over here, but some that seem to be prominent or promising to you and easy to adopt as well, because we're going to come back to the, you know, how difficult it is to be accepted politically, right? I don't know if we could rank them both in, into the effect or impact they can have and also political feasibility and mm-hmm. therefore find an optimum or uh, let's start with some examples first mm-hmm. and then we can have this discussion of uh, optimum or something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, so uh, to start with, I think I think really none of this is is really easy. I think it's really <laughs> it's really something uh, which which yeah, it's it's just um, really really difficult. Um, but uh, but of course they are different in terms of, of of difficulty. I mean, we we could just see at what is being implemented implemented to to see what's relatively easy like you can have some investments in renewable energy uh you can have some policies to reduce energy consumption to incentivize energy saving uh some labeling uh, maybe to to nudge behavior um these kind of things but that's not the growth per se but that's not per se, right? exactly because it's trying to sort of increase the efficiency of the system while while maintaining the growth economy basically so degrowth would necessitate much more radical changes uh, which um, in the end not only decouple well-being from gdp growth because currently if we if we just would do what would be necessary like to implement the really high carbon taxes to implement the caps on resource use which decline uh, very strongly energy quotas whatever um, uh, tariff structures progressive tariff stru- structures these kind of things then um, what would be the result is that there would be a lot less economic activity going on because so many things would just get so more expensive and um, uh, firms could not invest so much in, in uh, replacing human labor power with, with machines, making much more profit, etc. So basically the result would be a recession, like uh, people, investment strikes, capital flight, these kind of things. Um, so uh, you need to account for this. And I think that this is where it gets interesting. Um, like many degrowth and post-growth models then point to things like uh, universal basic income or uh, working time reductions and working time reduction is a really central one um, to basically reduce working time um, while uh, sharing the work which is there uh, so you can have basically uh, uh, declining GDP and and uh, still maintain the jobs the jobs because people work less and less yeah. and full um, employment yeah. and yeah and, and full employment um, yeah, but again, like all, all of these policies, I would say if you look in detail at them in, in the current economic context, which is like a very competitive uh, uh, economy where, where firms really uh, look at yeah what the competitors do and, and states do what other states do yeah. and, uh, and firms look at where the highest private capital investors look for the highest returns, um, etc. So um, there are a lot of issues for instance with a single country wanting to implement these mm. kind of measures mm. um, uh, so you need to account for that and for, for this for instance um, yeah it's it it gets really really complicated and I think there are a lot of debates uh, how to best do this um, like some say you need like very strong uh, state action to impose like capital controls for instance to impose job guarantees um, and uh, maximum incomes uh, to to reduce the inequality. Um, the, I think these are all important uh, uh, measures, but uh, I would also say that states historically have been like strong growth factors. You know, they have um, fostered growth. They have sort of um, um, increased economies of scale by keeping energy prices low, for instance. Um, so. As an actor, this points to me um, away from from the state as sort of the central actor to, to implement. I mean, it needs to implement those measures, um, but in order to get this, you basically need a bottom-up social movement, which which builds up the pressure uh, to to um, yeah make those actors uh, uh, bring those those uh, socially beneficial policies. Um, 
Um, yeah, because at least historically, I would say the um, states rather seem to to foster growth and uh, uh, also in terms of power, geo ge geopolitics, for instance, uh, is a big picture um, problem. Um, so these social movements are really central, um, and um, also in degrowth thought. Uh, so to be able, for instance, to, to via the means of a strike or uh, yeah uh, occupations these kind of things to to build up the pressure mm. um so yeah it's it's but this also necess necessitates sort of a cultural change which goes along with this sort of to not only build up the social trust uh, with that people can trust okay um uh, i won't suffer under this yeah. uh, because we have each other and we have the solidarity um i think this is a crucial point but also like the 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 confidence that this can create a better life quality mm. um, and this is basically the message of degrowth now like you can have a better life with that w with less stuff um if we if we increase democracy if we increase um long longevity of products um so these are the more radical um sides of things but the more immediate uh, 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 things you 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 mentioned, I mean, there are things like, um, for instance, right to repair or, or mm -hmm. longevity guarantees, um, uh, which can be, um, I think, with that, which are relatively um, easy to to implement, um, or also like things like a very weak green new deal uh, could be could be avenues uh, for pragmatic uh, changes. Um, but again, like the, I think the stronger your your grassroots is, the stronger the basis, and the more sort of costs you can impose, uh, the easier you will also get those reforms because, um, yeah, you can basically pressure uh, the state into making those concessions, mm. uh, also against uh, capital. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I think all of none of this is easy, and mm. it requires a lot of. Uh, yeah, uneasy conversations and organizing and um, yeah, um, um, work. Um, but we, we, we I, I don't think we have a, another choice than, than to do that, because no matter what comes, like th this things, what you build up, it will help us in any situation. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's funny how, well, beforehand at least, the uh, radical left was a vector of social change. Uh, reducing inequalities and all of that, but it was also very much embodied in, embedded within productivist approaches, right? Because mm -hmm. also we had to build stocks, we also had to to provide, you know, to lift po people out of poverty. There was a, a bunch of elements, but it seems that radical left <laughs> stayed there, uh, and now it's trying to reinvent itself. I think uh, with, uh, and I also heard with, uh, you know, as soon as the Friday for climate kind of radicalized itself a bit more into or politicized itself a bit more mm -hmm. we might have a convergence of let's say traditional politics and grassroots into one pathway i i don't know but uh, mm -hmm. that is perhaps one pathway that seems a bit promising to to see some traditional uh, political parties that get a bit more into out of the productivist but still maintain this you know, societal interest and in reducing inequalities, mm -hmm. and at the same time, like the the activists that really care about the environment only, and perhaps get more political, and there might be a convergence. I don't know what mm -hmm. whether you have any ideas about this, or because you also uh, are you involved with? Uh, the, I think you were involved. Does it still exist, Post Growth Zurich? Um, so it it, uh, it it transformed actually no it 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 evolved post growth Zurich transformed into uh, degrowth Switzerland. Okay, uh, okay. Which that was is my question. Like, what were the? Yeah. So, so what? Why did you choose? Because I found it very poetic as well. There is this question of a post growth city, which appeals very much to me to figure this out. Mm -hmm. um, what was the change about? Why did you choose to change it? Uh, yeah, that's a that's a, a a good question. I think um, like just historically, it uh, evolved out of a strengthening of um, degrowth and post-growth thought, also in the the Romandie, the, the Western Switzerland uh, Switzerland part, 
um, among others, also with the arrival of, of uh, Julia Steinberger in, in Lausanne. And um, th this was sort of the, it seemed the logical step to us to combine sort of our strengths and uh, to to go national <laughs> with with this organization um, and to foster sort of degrowth thought in the whole of Switzerland to increase our reach uh, there. Um, so that's basically why we changed from, from Postgraph Zurich to, to Degrowth Switzerland to um, yeah increase our reach and reunite sort of these both <laughs> hubs. Um, but yeah, we still have, like I would say, a bit of a local roots and local focus, mm. uh, both in Zurich and, and in Lausanne. Um, and it's also like a relatively young organization. Um, so, so we were founded last year. Um, only and it's it's uh, an evolving process also to find our strategy our own yeah. strategy and and uh, how we want to approach this um so yeah that's that's all in development um i would say um but yeah so i would say we haven't done a ton of work on like how to create a post growth city or yeah. a degrowth city uh so much i would think that Maybe um, people from the transition movement have mm -hmm. thought more about this, which are also quite strong in Zurich, uh, for instance. Um, but yeah, so so we were also well, in Romandie as well. There is the there are lots of the true yeah. transition Swiss Roman or something. Like uh, that. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, totally. Um, <laughs> no, um, yeah, but. Uh, so, so what we did mostly was a bit of um, was a bit of a too strong. Also, we we recognized this too strong of an academic focus. We had a lot of reading circles. Uh, also, tried to formulate our own understanding of of degrowth and postgrowth and how this relates to to yeah issues in Switzerland mm -hmm. um, uh, more specifically. And um, yeah, that's a very time intensive pro process as well. Um, so yeah, we are we are still seeing where we where we sit in terms of like concrete projects uh in terms of grassroots notopia uh, projects to have have uh, um, uh, projects in the here and now which embody idea growth ideas um but also like political change in terms of um, um state policies and also like um, connection to social movements and um such as the climate strike, for instance. So we are all like in between this. <laughs> <laughs> so it's an interesting uh, mix. Um, but it's quite hard, actually. I mean, one of the barriers, I think, of uh, degrowth as well is the imaginary, like what is a degrowth lifestyle? Mm -hmm. um, there, it's very easy also to imagine it when you look at transition towns. So I think there is, you know, that's more on the bottom-up approach, but then at the top level, what can you do and should you do it? What is the right scale to do it? So... Um, find it a, a quite a challenging task to to figure out or triangulate between movements, ideas, um, what is feasible in what in what scale and all of that. So um, that might be also a good segue to uh, I don't remember in which paper you mentioned that there are future research directions that might be relevant as well mm -hmm. to head. Like uh, you mentioned. Um, how do we achieve fundamental changes in lifestyle? Um, how do we uh, deal with unsustainable, unethical, and unjust parts of uh, consumption? Um, what are some governance and institutions needed to explore these future pathways and all of that? So, yeah. what in your from you know dealing between associations, academia, um, also as a activist uh, yourself? How do you find uh, the um, how can you um, underline some future pathways of research still needed? I mean, I guess you still want to finish your, your research so you have a clear idea of where you personally are, are headed. <laughs> but um, perhaps it's a, at a wider community level. Where do you think we should head and what is still useful? Given that, you know, we're in an urgent need of, uh, of action, what is still uh, relevant to, to be researched? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's a ton of things which which <laughs> need to be re researched. Uh, the, yeah, it's it's a, it's quite a lot. Um, I think like the the recent uh, um, grant which was won by by George Callis, Jason Hickel, uh, U.S. Steinberger, this goes very much in this direction of the open questions uh, still to be tackled. 
um, I think, uh, like for me, uh, the, the most interesting part maybe is the, that we have like this internal heterogeneity within uh, degrowth, uh, especially also in terms of uh, uh, strategic uh, thought. Mm -hmm. strategy i mean it's a big topic there was a degrowth conference with the focus on strategy because everyone feels okay there's a need to to better st strategize um and i totally agree with this <laughs> uh so i think that's that's a, a huge avenue for for more research to also clarify uh those heterogeneities and where they come from and yeah also i think to a degree you have to evaluate which which uh, one of those strategies are they contradictory um which one if so which one has more merit uh, maybe which one has the higher likelihood of, of being effective um so i think this assessment is is really uh, important and i mean yeah i'm i'm planning i'm trying to to uh, to contribute to this in, in my in my phd um, with a look at sort of growth imperatives uh, again, uh, because it's sort of the I, I I think it's a basis for like deciding the strategy, the the problem analysis. Okay, where does the problem come from actually? Um, so to to reassess the theoretical debates we have there, um, yeah. And in in terms of in terms of uh, concretely where we should go, um, I think it's super important to look at the connection between um, degrowth and uh, um, yeah, social movements, specifically working, working class worker movements, um, because I, I think this is, um, yeah, this is sort of a, a precondition for, for degrowth, that you have this, this bottom-up mobilization of uh, working people who have the trust uh, in each other and the solidarity built up to know that um, uh, yeah, these changes won't negatively affect uh, uh, them. Um, and uh, to be able to sort of assert the pressure to push these policies through, as I, as I described. Um, so I think this is, a, this is a really important avenue. And I think this can also bring back a lot of what what has been theorized already in in for instance classical uh classical um, um more more libertarian socialist traditions um which i think are um under included in, in the research uh, uh community which has more of this focus on the nautopias in the here and now cooperatives uh, these kind of things and then more the the state socialist uh, aspect of like uh, public ownership and uh, um, state-centered transitions, um, but not really like a um, working class, um, yeah, class struggle, um, um, uh, bottom-up still focus, uh, which is very participatory, very horizontal, um, which also existed historically. So I think that's that's um, personally, I think that's an avenue which has a lot of promise. Um, but yeah, for me, it was a, a long story or long journey to 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 come to this point. And mm. yeah, maybe I, <laughs> I in a few years I will think differently, you know. Yeah. But um, I think in terms of literature and in terms of research, that's uh, that's underexplored in in my view. And it has a lot of potential um, to also resolve um, problems in terms of this tension between the bottom up and the top down which is everywhere yeah. um so yeah so i i hope this answers a bit your, your question but i think there are like many many avenues for 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 research also in the modeling part per se like yeah. making actual integrated assessment modeling of of degrowth it, it is coming there are more and more studies mm -hmm. but um there yeah, need to be more of course yeah. so yeah. so if you are uh current or future researcher please uh, uh, take these in, into your consideration uh, we definitely need more hands and brains uh, in this operation um, before we conclude I don't know if you have any topics that you would like to cover that we haven't covered so far mm, this is a very good uh, question I mean we have we have covered quite a lot um, but yeah, maybe maybe one 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 small point is 
important, I think, because lots of lots of times when you hear like this green growth, degrowth tr discussion, mm -hmm. the, the the biggest retort against degrowth is yeah, this is this is impossible in terms of social change in this short amount of time. We don't have time. We need to act now. Mm -hmm. So we need to be pragmatic um, and and focus on the small changes which we can win here and now. And I, I think, and, and this is then more in line with, with green growth, for instance, to have a bit uh, of efficiency improvements and these kind of things. Um, and I think this is really a, a problematic way of thinking about this because... Um, uh, we, if we really want to solve the problem in the longer term, we really need to start now to think about how to solve the problem itself. And degrowth points to like capitalism, the growth economy as the the key driver, basically, of 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 the 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 social ecological crises. Um, and also in terms of coming crises, which which are coming, which are upon us in many parts of the world. Um, as as soon the sooner we start building those those structures and uh, support each other, build those networks of solidarity and um, self reliance, and see what we can do as people ourselves in terms of putting pressure on 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 those in power, basically, um, the more leeway and the more um, possibilities we will have in the coming coming crisis, no matter what happens. Mm -hmm. And it's also, I think. When in, when it comes to time, no, we don't have time. Then we should look at what are the most effective mm. ways, strategies of change. And I, I think the case can be made that historically this was really having actual radical movements, uh, which can threaten the system and which can put costs on the system via strikes, via uh, uh, occupations of like um, um, and strikes also in terms of. Um, um, Housing, uh, where people um, um, don't pay don't pay rent, for instance, with increasing rent prices, these kind of things, them really imposing material costs. That there's a huge lever mm -hmm. in terms of change, and um, also it 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 um, leads to concessions, trying to pacify those those struggles. I mean, then an, ex an example is the the New Deal and all, like which is often brought up for of, of Green New Deal. Uh, um, advocates that this was in a context of basically global revolution like yeah. communist threats these kind of things very strong working class movement strikes etc um, and also of course economic crisis and um, this was a way of pacifying and restoring the trust in the in, in the institutions and re regaining growth and and power so in terms of time and radical change, we basically need to try the impossible and uh, um, yeah, have this, this um, um, yeah, op optimism of the will and even if there's a pessimism of the intellect uh, uh, to cite Gramsci. But <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, I think that's really crucial um, and it's missing in, uh, in a lot of um, discussions because, yeah... Um, I, I I get the the struggle with the time and uh, the the urgency, but it, urgency can also be like an argument to make res repressive uh, changes, authoritarianism, uh, these kind of issues. And I think we really need to be very careful uh, um, and um, yeah, work against that. Mm. Yeah. Um, to finish, perhaps, do you have any initiative or book or movie or article that seems like? very to the point and something that will help us to to dive deeper in all, some of these topics one or all of the topics that we have covered uh, today i know it's always the tricky question like hmm, i wish i had prepared for that <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was actually in my mind right now yeah um yeah i mean in terms of books uh, i guess the the best book in my mind on, on degrowth really is uh, the, the future is, is degrowth by, by Matthias Schmelzer et al um, Aaron Vassinjan and Andrea Vetter and uh, I mean it's a rather academic one so as an introduction it's maybe not the best uh, book but it's super comprehensive and it uh, talks a lot about the things which we have uh, discussed as well um, yeah um, other things it's a bit it's a bit hard. I, 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 I really like uh, the text uh, from. It's it's a shorter text, uh, which I think 
encompasses some of the things I, I said quite well for, for those who want to look it up. It's uh, from Tom Wetzel uh, and it's on eco-syndicalism uh, and the Green New Deal. And I think it, it describes sort of this interaction quite well. I, I talked about between like this grassroots movement and the, the reforms which we so urgently need. Um, and it also, yeah, uh, it's, it casts a, a strategy to a um, very participatory, very highly democratic uh, future, uh, which uh, still is sustainable and uh, provides a good life for all. So I think this is like a shorter text, which can be interesting. You can find it online uh, by Googling. Yeah. Uh, oh no, uh, Duck Duck Gone. Um, <laughs> or Brave or whatever, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, not, not to support the, the monopolists. So, yeah. Yeah, I think I would have to think more about different, uh, different texts. Um, yeah. Well, you can always share them. Uh. Sure, you can. <laughs> You can look at my my uh, Mastodon account now. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll no. need to teach me. I I went yesterday and tried to figure out Mastodon, but it seems like a it, how do you pick your server and all mm. that. I'm looking at my peers to figure out where to to fit, and then what happens, and <laughs> it's refreshing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it takes some time um, for sure. I I also I'm also not uh, an expert by by any chance, but. Yeah, it, uh, it's fascinating. I, th I think I, I like it because it avoids some problems of, of Twitter, like with the, with the quote tweeting and the, yeah. the sh really short text. It has more more space. I, I really like it so far. Uh, yeah, But it's I agree, it's a, it's a challenge of, <laughs> of settling somewhere else. It's really hard. Um, As um, uh, Anaïs Tilquin uh, from uh, Renovate Switzerland said, habits are the bane of our existence, you know, because of habit, that's why we don't change. <laughs> yeah, oh man. But uh, yeah, thanks so much, uh, Lawrence. Thank you. It was a very fun discussion. Yeah, uh, likewise, I, I really enjoyed it. And uh, thanks for the really important questions and um, yeah, for, for the interest in our work. Like, uh, I, 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 I just have to say maybe that, yeah, I owe huge amounts uh, to, to Manfred Lenzen for instance, but also uh, my partner at the time who supported me very much and my family as well. So I think it's important to really see the, the context um, as well. So there's a lot of contributions from all uh, around, all, all corners, sort of the acknowledgements, <laughs> uh, which which are really important to, yeah, to say. It's not like uh, I... I could only like write those papers because of all this social network and support. Yeah. yeah. Well, th thanks once again, and thanks everyone to listening, watching until the end. I mean, don't hesitate if you have questions, if this resonates, if this is something that you would like to explore further, if you have ideas for policies, if you were looking for a master uh, thesis uh, subject or a PhD topic, I hope this resonates as well for you. <laughs> And uh, don't hesitate to share it around with your colleagues, with your friends, to continue stimulating our our brains. And uh, I'll I'll say uh, I'll see you in two weeks for for a new episode. And until then, uh, if you like this topic, uh, we recorded other episodes uh, on similar topics so with Julia Steinberger, with Tim Jackson, with George Goscalis, uh, Timothy Parik. So there is uh, a number of colleagues that might uh, give a uh, a slightly nuanced or different uh, view on what we have just said today. Thanks again. Thank you again. And Thank see you. you all in two weeks. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>